And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple. Some of you may know him as the as the head GM for Tabletopless. Others may know him as the Dungeon Dilf. Some may know him as simply Grim. But I know him as the as the one and only James Desbro. I'm hoping I got it right this time. It's been two years. You, How you, you doing did. today, man? I've been practicing. I'm I'm all right. I didn't know he was supposed to be drunk. I better have a couple of shots. <laughs> Castle Danger in my case. Oh. <laughs> By Frost Aquavit for me. Yeah. But so it's been it's been about it's been about two years. How have you how have you been holding up, man? <laughs> Not well. Um <laughs> this last year's been uh, pretty much a write off <laughs> due to due to health issues. So yeah. At the end of end of last year. Um, I got really unwell uh, just after I launched my Kickstarter. Uh, well, Indiegogo, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that kind of put the put the kibosh on the whole year. So I've been in and out of hospital and had an operation and all sorts, and uh, yeah, still still dealing with it. So yeah, it's been a been a shit <laughs> shitty year. Well, hope hopefully a bit of time in the temple can help can help out in. In some small way. Hopefully, how much do you charge for healing spells? Uh I pay. We we tend we tend to pay we tend to pay in hops. <laughs> uh. <laughs> uh. But let's get let's get into what into Whitechester. Mm -hmm. So. As I understand it, White Ch Whitechester is is a city crawl, um, mm -hmm. and I think, and I think the best way to describe a city crawl would be would be a hex crawl, but in a city instead of a, instead of a massive re region of 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 uninhabited land. Yeah, and block by block rather mm -hmm. than hex by hex. Yeah. yeah. Um, Given the fact that it's dealing with a seventeenth century, a seventeenth century um, city where the dead have risen from the grave, and it, and this place is a is a is is described as a prison for the kingdom society, um, mm -hmm. I I have to get the obvious out of the way. Did anyone did when you when you were doing the elevator pitch for Whitechester? Did anyone bring up Mordheim? <laughs> uh, yes, but there's a lot of similar ideas going around. I, I can't remember when Mordheim came out, but I had the original idea for this back in around 2013. Uh, yeah, and it took me that long to get around get around to it. Um, and the bigger issue for me wasn't Mordheim so much, which I don't think is a prison. Um, but uh, a comic series called Defoe 1666, mm -hmm. which was uh, exactly like a whole bunch of the ideas I've been working on, and part of the reason I didn't I didn't do this earlier is because I was like, ah, oh, fuck it, if I put this out now, people are going to think I'm just ripping that off. Yeah. Um, but I think enough time has passed, and that comic book series has changed enough. Mm -hmm. um, but hope hopefully, it doesn't seem too similar to people. Yeah. Also, I checked. Um, Mordheim was first published in 1999. Okay, well, I I had stopped playing anything Games Workshop really by about 1990, because um, they stopped selling other role playing games and they were just turned White Dwarf into a catalog, and so in protest around 1990. White Dwarf 100, I kind of stopped paying much attention to Games Workshop products. So, yeah, there's some uh, there's some superficial similarities from what I know about Mordheim, but I don't know that much yeah. about Mordheim. Uh, but e even, even with that, the idea of 
of um, pr of prison cities or the, or this one city that's cut that's kind of cut off from the rest of a kingdom is is certainly is certainly not a new concept and there's pl and there's plenty there's there's plenty there's plenty of IP, IPs and the like that have di that have dipped into it because it's it's tap it's tapping into that isolation fear yeah and i think it's a it's such a common trope in the different ways because it's so useful especially for for horror to trap people within a particular location mm -hmm. um i mean i wrote the original cannibal sector one book for for sla industries and that's a fallen part of the city beyond the wall that's full of weird dreadful stuff um so you can see sort of similarities there or in comics like Judge Dredd, there's the Undercity, which is old New York, you know, mm -hmm. buried beneath the new mega city with all kinds of weird mutants and odd stuff going on down there. Mm -hmm. So, just because an idea's been done before doesn't mean it's a bad idea or that you can't put your own spin on it. And I think I've managed to put my own spin. Uh, on. My mentor would often would often say, if you st if you steal from one source, it's plagiarism. If you steal from many sources, it's research. <laughs> yeah. Plus, I f I find maybe maybe it's just me, but I f I find that some cer that cer that searching for searching for what some what something it it's it's a pendulum thing. The idea uh, the idea of um of looking of looking at a work and seeing what were the kind of things that inspired it is a f is a fun thing to explore hmm. when it be when it becomes figuring out what it trying to figure out what it ripped off <laughs> then at worst it ends up becoming a dick measuring contest i e to someone sh someone trying to humble brag about how much they're in the know of a cer of a certain subject matter yeah whether that be film, whether that be games, or what or whatnot, and that's when that's when it goes a little bit too far. Yeah, and um, trying to sort of latch onto something someone's done and say, "Oh, this is ripping this, that, and the other off," and they may not even know about these other things you mentioned. There's there's often a sort of zeitgeist. People tend to come up with similar ideas at similar times. It happens quite often. Um, often I'll come up with an idea for a for a game or a book, and then someone else either has released it or is about to release it or is working on it, you know, and it it goes on the back burner after yeah. that to see if they actually follow through. Um, like I had a very uh, similar idea to Skarka's Far West, <laughs> which I believe still hasn't come out. Um, so I didn't pursue my idea because I thought that was <laughs> that was coming. So mm -hmm. yeah, lesson learned, I guess. I've um, I've had a I've had a few people who, what who have talked about wanting to de wanting to design their own game wanting to design their own games and one, one thing I ended up yelling at at some folk about on on my server was, to was to stop, stop putting so so much thought into how into how original your system is or in what in one case your die mechanic because that's force for the trees yeah because he he was worried that hit that his that people would look at the die system that he was he had come up with and said that he and he was worried he was going to get accused of be of ripping off um chaosium basic right and i'm like People are gonna people are gonna accuse you of ripping off no matter what you do. So fuck it. Yeah, and there's an open version of Basic now anyway. So yeah, f fill your boots. <laughs> it's not like you can copyright a system anyway. So you can you cannot copyright you cannot copyright mechanics. Yeah, I'm pr I'm pretty sure. Not that not that some people haven't tried. I'm pretty I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure Wiz I'm pretty sure Wizards of the Coast would would love to copyright the idea of tapping. Yeah, they tried to, I believe. As long as you don't call it tapping though, I think you're fine. Yeah, for it's it's kind of 
I've heard I've heard stories that the re the reason Games Workshop ha spells their orcs with a K is because they tried to trademark orcs, but you're dealing with a mytho you're dealing with a mythological thing, and that's uncopyrightable. Yeah, that may be true. Yeah, I was just to differentiate them from the fantasy orcs. I don't, I don't know. It's probably a little of column A and probably a little of column B. Hmm. Especially, especially since. The the ev the i the idea of of tr of claim of claiming om ownership over um, over a mechanic when you're putting that much work into it it's understandable why somebody would w would want to try and pull that but because of how broad mechanics are I th that's I think part of the reason why you can why why it why attempts to try and claim ownership over a mechan over a mechanic ends up dying a very quick death yeah but now some something i do f something i do find kind of kind of amu kind of amusing is um go is going with horror fantasy since in certain in certain mediums, horror fantasy is a little bit harder to come by. Hmm. Uh, in in stuff like comics and novels, not not so much. In terms of in terms of film, significantly more so. There's only a handful of horror fantasy films I can think of. Yeah, I mean, uh, where's the dividing line between sort of historical? fiction and um and fantasy because there's quite a lot of quasi historical stuff that deals with things like witches or or whatever else that you'll find out there that's mm. kind of fantasy but kind of not i guess yeah and the it is a, it is a once the lower and lower fan, in the fantastical end of things, the closer and closer one could argue that you're do, that you're doing historical fiction. I, for me personally, I look at it once again like a pendulum. Hmm. Or I guess spectrum would be a bit would be a better would be a better word for it. It it it's. But it's also it's ultimately down to in, down to interpretation and how much the history part part is important. Yeah. And obvious obviously in the case of Whitechester, it being a sit being a city crawl. The history. I, would it be fair of me to say that the history part of it of it being in an alternative seventeenth century England is. More to prov more to provide the foundation than something that's out outright needed. Yeah, I mean, you you could drop it into your standard game of, of something else mm -hmm. without having to having to set it in seventeenth century England. Um, but it, as a as a time period, I think it works well. I think that's something that Lamentations of the Flame Princess has done well. Um, in setting itself in the sort of early modern period, which encompasses this this sort of time, so you could drop it in elsewhere. But I think it does ground it and set expectations if you if you do use the historical period. Mm -hmm. And of course, of course, the of course the other the other thing that makes that a bit makes that a bit tricky is. Um, a lot of the is the is how how ga how ga how games like um games like D like D and D or a lot or a lot of OSR games ha handle um the historical aspect. In fact, the reason why Chivalry and Sorcery was even made was because its creator was dissatisfied with how D and D handled um the the historical Europe a aspect of it. Yeah. Although, I'm, oh, go ahead. Uh, so I'm so I've got some training in history, and I'm interested in history. Mm -hmm. When it comes to making games, I think you can be too much of a slave to 
to total accuracy. So what I usually aim for in my games is a mixture of genre emulation and, and plausibility. So mm -hmm. if I'm writing um, a harder-edged modern spy game, then I would choose a system that is harder-edged, a little crunchier, um, and I would try to represent things close to how they actually are, whereas in a fantasy game, you know, the more fantasy you include, the more loosey-goosey you can be about it. And I think the demands of being a game... Uh, means that you have to bend things a little bit to keep it playable, to play to the player's expectations. It's it's nice to be able to educate people a little bit about history, um, but at the same time, you don't you don't want it to be an educational product. <laughs> you know, that that's death. Yeah, and that's why even I. That's why I brought up um, chivalry and sorcery, because it it is trying it is trying very hard to to go full to go full medieval fantasy, hmm. but it is a bit it is significantly on the cr on the crunchier end of things, and that makes it a bit and that makes it a bit of an ask at times. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And this is coming from somebody who's who's interviewed the who's interviewed the guy who's who's responsible for the for the most recent version of it. But, yeah. he, but um, a sp sometimes you have to call a spade a spade. And yeah. I'm not a, I'm not opposed to crunch. I don't do I don't do the heavy crunch bad, light crunch good dichotomy that some people do. Hmm. I usually I just say. Whichever whichever le de level of depth you're going with, there's going to be consequences. You want you want to go full, you want to go full free form? Okay, you're going to be dealing with a lot of choices and potentially choice paralysis. It's just how this works. Yeah, and I I believe system matters. So you know, mm -hmm. like I said, it's it's choosing the right system for the right setting. It's crunch isn't necessarily bad, especially once you all understand the system and. Then it rapidly speeds up, as any other system does. And the more complicated and crunchy systems have the capacity for greater sort of granularity, where small things can make a difference, and not it's not just broad strokes like it is in a lot of the very light systems. Mm -hmm. You know, you you strap a laser sight to your gun in Fate, and it doesn't really make too much of a difference. You do that in Millennium's End, and it's going to make a you know a meaningful difference. All critics have their whipping boys, and I will admit, to a certain extent, fate is one of mine. <laughs> I uh, like it for 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 what it's good for, um, but it gets used for things that it's not necessarily the best thing for. Uh, my bugbear is powered by the apocalypse <laughs> games. I don't mind P PBT PBTA the the. The big, the burr up my ass when it came to when it came to fate, and it's the reason why I haven't covered a fate game in a while because because I feel I'd be repeating myself. Mm. Is a lack of guidance when it comes to aspects. As with something like aspects, you're essentially handling the table a blank check, and providing exa and making clear the line between good between a good aspect and a bad aspect is something that should be made clear and it kind of doesn't. Yeah. Um I've cited I've I've cited what I mean by that by this kind of thing at, as a as a counterexample is the there's a two-page spread in 13th age about the one unique thing and what would what would fit the idea of one unique thing and what might be pushing the line. Yeah. And why? Now, so certain fate games are the exception to this rule, like Tiansha. Whenever I whenever I talk about fate, I usually end up saying, "Okay, Tiansha, I'm putting you in a bubble and I'm moving you over here. Everything I say doesn't reflect on you because you're in your bubble." <laughs> <laughs> but now I now on the on the topic of on the topic of city on the topic of city crawls. Um, since you mentioned it being block by block, in within the 
within the PDF or the or the physical book itself, do you ha do you have do you have a block by block map of Whitechester, or do you go a bit more abstract? So, it was it's already a five hundred page book, and if I put in maps for every single building, then it would have been several times that size. I think um, by the end, I meant I meant a map of Whitechester as a whole, not. Ev not yeah. maps of every building. <laughs> there's, so there's a map of the city and there's a map of each sort of subset area of the city. And then within that, every single building is detailed in text. Yeah. Room by room. By room. And a lot of, a lot of times the way, the way hex crawls end up working is, is moving between segmented areas, i.e. I hexes. And then the GM rolling on some sort of event table, or sometimes multiple tables, depend depending on the hex crawl and depending on the game. Um, with Whitechester, is it a, is 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 it a similar manner when moving between blocks? So each building has its own little story and may have, you know, particular creatures or undead that are hanging out there. Like if a family walled themselves in or, or whatever um then they'll all still be in there um but then you also have undead out on the streets wandering mm -hmm. around and other survivors and so on so it's a mix of random and set uh encounters mm -hmm. and with when it comes to when it comes to the encounters even even though on the description you you mentioned it mentions the dead coming back I get the feeling it's not limited to just uh, to just zombies walking around walking around the place. No. Um so well, there's many different types of zombies. I've tried to create an interesting roster of ones that relate to the locations that they're in to an extent. Like um horrible stuff that was collected from people's houses like shit and piss and refuse mm -hmm. was usually taken away and processed in a you know in a less salubrious part of town so if you encounter a zombie there then they're likely to be covered in this stuff and to to stink and their flesh to be sloughing off and that sort of thing mm -hmm. or uh, you might find one caught up in a in a machine and uh, stuck trying to get to you, or cut in half by some other event that happened and dragging itself along the along the ground towards you. Yeah. Uh, some people will have starved to death, so they'll be sort of skeletal zombies. Um, some people will have resorted to things like cannibalism. So you might find people that have been transformed into ghouls by what they've been forced to do to survive that that sort of thing so there's a there's a big variety mm -hmm. and then what has caused the dead to rise and other strange things to happen also has a kind of warping mutating effect on the thing on the things within the city i'm never exactly explicit about what it is exactly that that has happened or or how it works but the, you can infer from what's there is that is that is that your version of of never show the monster? <laughs> kind of. Um, I've got my own interpretation, but it's meant to leave it open so that games masters can choose to take one route or the other about about what is going on here. You know, was it a cult that caused this? Was it the comet? What is the comet? What yeah? You know, what was it made of? What did it do? Um. There's some hints around the city that some people knew this was going to happen, or at least somewhat knew this was going to happen. So how much did they know? Is it a coincidence? So there's there's space for you to come up with your own interpretations. Mm -hmm. And even even with that, there's nothing stopping the G the GM from not explaining it. Because no. no. how many times? Have, because you're no you're no stranger to horror movies. We. You and I have seen plenty of times where the worst thing to do, the worst thing to do to a story is explain why something happened. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, your characters by by default are supposed to be uh, criminals or the wrongly convicted, if you insist, who've been thrown into this place anyway. So you, your chief concern is survival, 
mm-hmm. and maybe trying to get out, not not figuring out what the hell's going on. Yeah, of course, if if someone wanted to, I could I could easily see them them going with the idea of they the crim of the criminal thing being a cover, and they were hired by by some nobility to to get something out of this out of the city. Yeah, sure. And uh, the authorities are happy for people to volunteer to go in and you know slaughter the undead. They want to reclaim the city eventually. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> you know, if you're stupid enough, go for it. And well, it it'd be very e- it'd be very easy to to lure people in by by saying we'll give we'll give you a f- we'll give you a few dozen shillings if you get if you man if you manage to <laughs> if you manage to get get in get get what we get what we ask for and get out. Yeah, you could do um, like a zombie heist sort sort of thing if you wanted to easily. I mean, and there's going to be nobles that lived in there, and their houses are just open for people to loot or for the for the dead to root through. There might be records that they'd rather people didn't find, or family treasures or heirlooms that they want retrieved. So yeah, there's, there's plenty of plenty of options. And the temptation would be too great for some noble to find dirt on one of his rivals. Of course. Because. Well, that that's the way that's the way it go that's the way it goes, and I even even beyond that, it, you could just as easily do the th- do the thing of whatever you loot, you can keep as long as long as you live as long as you live to payday. Yeah, yeah. Or as long as you get me this one thing that I want. I mean, in, intrigue is a good way to look at it. So it's set not long after. If you go with the official setting, mm-hmm. it's set not long after. Um, the end of the Commonwealth and the restoration of King Charles II. Mm-hmm. So it's just been at the end of a very sort of repressive period when the whole country was divided in the English Civil War. So you can certainly see that people might want to get the dirt on nobles that fought for the other side or find uh, evidence of someone's Catholicism. And that would be quite damning if you could find that. So the, yeah, this this the historical setting lends itself to a certain amount of um, amount of intrigue and skullduggery. Mm-hmm. Plus, whenever whenever you have whenever you have some degree of upheaval, there's always going to be a certain a certain a certain seg a certain segment who longs for the quote unquote good old days. Yeah, i.e. D- I. Yeah. doesn't li- doesn't like the fa- doesn't like the massive change that happens because pe- because people don't like change yeah well i mean the commonwealth period was one of of massive change that wasn't really followed through on uh cromwell got rid of the monarchy but then he failed to live up to the promises that he'd made to various groups of radicals so there were a lot of uh communes and religious groups and political groups with all kinds of different clashing ideas and then when the monarchy was restored they were kind of betrayed for a second time so yeah there's there's certainly a lot a lot going on there and i mean in 1666 a lot of people in england genuinely thought it was the end of the world Mm -hmm. uh we'd had two comets in real life in 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 rapid succession the great fire of london happened uh plague had come back we went to war with the Dutch. It just seemed like everything was going wrong all at once, kind of like it is now, really. <laughs> so. uh, when some people get re- some people get really mad at me whenever whenever they do that, whenever they give the speech about about the state of things, and I end up playing, um, I end up playing. It's the end of the world as we as we know it. Uh, <laughs> uh. Of course, these days they get mad, they get mad at me because because I end up because I end up ruining Whamageddon for them. <laughs> you've probably you've probably heard about that particular game. Yes, yes, that's oh. yeah. Because well, la- last year I ruined it. For, I ruined it for all my coworkers because at the last second bef- on Chris, just as everybody was leaving for Christmas Eve. I had secretly planted a a wireless speaker, and I I played it while I was at a distance. <laughs> so I man I managed to get like tw- I managed to get like twenty five people in one go. Good body count. 
good good but good body count and if that if that sounds evil well one it is two every G, every dm and some some might some might claim that some might claim otherwise but they are but they are lying to themselves has a little bit of sadism in them or a lot <laughs> at the very minimum they have a little yeah and anyone who claims otherwise is lying to themselves cuz you you can't you kind of have to if you're going to be mess if you're going to be messing with players heads in one form or another yeah yeah but that's a, a safe remove cuz you you know it's not it's not really real but mm -hmm. uh, it can give you a little thrill nonetheless yeah plus some um... I well in my in my case I've I've had some people who were so who were so paranoid about um ch about checking for traps in dungeons that I would I would put in tr I would put in um fake traps. Yeah. They're a trap mechanism that does absolutely nothing. So they go they go through all they go through all that tension, all of those rolls and <laughs> it, the, it's a trap that's completely useless. <laughs> not that it's a, one... not that it's broken. It lit, it it was literally designed to do nothing. <laughs> I had one that was so the door wasn't actually locked, but it had this big elaborate looking box lock on it. Mm -hmm. But the the box lock was the actual trap. So if you tried to pick it, that's when the trap went off. But if you just turned the handle and opened the door, it would just open. <laughs> Yeah, it's. I suppose it's kind of like what? What's the safest way to? What's the safest way to, to deprive some to deprive someone of their weapon? And some some people think disarm. Some people think, um, bi some people think bind them in some way. No, the safest way is ask them for it. <laughs> but when it, now. You had you had met you had mentioned uh, you had mentioned in the descriptor that that this is this could be run, this could be run using using five e grim dark five e mork borg and um oh and osr games um taking taking that taking that into account how easy or difficult is it to to um write this kind of thing in that middle ground between being completely setting agnostic and uh not setting agnostic set um system agnostic and system specific um so i mean it works fine um in this instance with everything except fifth edition um because undead are typically sort of low level enemies and if you take your your party in to Whitechester, you're going to rapidly outlevel most of the stuff that's in there. So mm -hmm. I think if you were just to play vanilla Five E through it, you would have to restrict the healing magic a bit, or just not allow clerics, um, and slow down the slow down the leveling process uh, a great deal. Um, uh, grim, my, my grim dark rules kind of deal with that by virtue of lessening the amount of hit points, reducing the amount of healing. So that that tends to work better, but it's not actually that much you need to change um, in order to be compatible with grim dark. Morkborg is a pretty simple, brutal system anyway, so mm -hmm. that works well. Um, OSR, I mean, it's particularly had Lamentations of the Flame Princess in mind when I wrote it. But OSR tends to be more deadly anyway, especially at the lower levels. Yeah. So that that's not so much of a problem. Though, so I mean, the, 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 the setting and the, and the game and the ideas came came first, and then I just kind of uh, wangled the system around what I needed. Yeah, that that tends to be how the chicken and egg. Um... Scenario go, goes with these kind of things. Um, of course, the of course the other problem with with trying to use vanilla five e with this is is dealing with challenge rating because 
I know I might be in the minority with this, but I never liked. Ch I didn't like challenge rating back in 2000. I still don't like it. Um, it would work fine if it was calculated correctly, but it doesn't seem to be. Um, oh. I used. I used to use a website called D&D Combat to run simulations to get an idea of how challenging an encounter would actually be, but that site's shut down now, unfortunately. Oh. Now, t of, of course, when it comes to... When it comes, OSR, ten, OSR does tend to be on the brutal side, although... Um, Depending on depending on the choice of of OSR or OS or adjacent game, um, there's st there's still there's still a bit there's still a bit of a spectrum involved. I mean, person personally, when personally my go my go to for as far as what as far as what OSR um, adjacent game that I that I use to get that style is stuff is stuff like either Axe or um, most more recently, worlds without number. Mm -hmm. If only, if only because Crawford is a madman. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I could. But there's plenty of others I can see. And well, Morkborg was a rid was a rid was originally a lit a literal one page system. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and. I can I can see you I can see utilizing um lamentations since I I still have I still have the I still have the that early box set of lamentations of the flame princess. Yeah. Oh. Uh, Cuz I'm I'm a sucker for box sets. <laughs> <laughs> and now when it, now given given the given the sheer pa given the sheer page count um on the PDF version, did you make sure to have it bookmarked? Yes. If I produce something over a hundred pages, I generally bother to bookmark it and give it a proper index, even though it's a huge pain in the ass. And I've had people complain to me that they'd rather do their own bookmarks, and I've had people complain when I don't put bookmarks in. There's no way to win. Uh, but it seems to me that when a, when a book's really big, you probably should. Yeah. From my own exper from my own experiences, I would, r I would rather have it bookmarked than not. Um, if there's some, ca if there's a case where, where I, where the bo where bookmarks aren't aren't organized in a way that I'd like, I can just I can just do them I can just do them myself if need be. I've done that before. Um, yeah. it's honestly it's honestly not that hard. Um, but. The, the I've made I've made it clear in plenty of videos on this channel that I'm a bit that I'm a stickler for proper navigation, and a a lot of it is due to my experiences having to navigate through Palladium books. <laughs> yeah, um, so we've been having this problem on Tabletopless playing Vampire because the new fifth edition book is really badly laid out. Um, and really badly indexed, so it's it's one where I've gone and gotten the PDF because it's just so much easier to run a search through an electronic document than it is to find something in the book. <laughs> so. I, have, I think I haven't. Always... Oh, yeah, was... but I think that's always a tension in design, though. Um, are you creating it as an object to be referenced, an object to be read, um, an art book almost? Uh, yeah, you know, what what is what is the purpose of your book? Something like GURPS is more technical manual than than game, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Something like Morkborg is more of an art book. Um, some games put their their fiction and their story front and center. You know, there's different emphasis in in different games. Yeah, but it's a, it's a hard thing to judge. It's a hard it's a hard thing to judge for for me personally. I the thing I keep I. The mantra that I've had is, "Don't forget the game in role-playing game." Yeah, like as nice as it might be to to go art to go artsy with with a certain book, um, it's still a game, and games are and games have to be played. Yeah, i've I've gotten I've gotten on some games that 
want that want to act like a coffee table bo um, art book instead instead of a game. And well, the I already I already mentioned the whole thing with with navigation and even um, yeah. even even some not even some non Palladium games that I like. I've got I got I've gotten on them the early early PDF release of Shiver. Um, didn't have any bookmarks, and that thing's about two hundred and fifty pages. Yeah, <laughs> gotta be said. I'm not normally a fan of the super heavy tomes. Um, yeah, I think back to games I bought in my youth, mm -hmm. and they're relatively slim. You know, even something like even something like Rollmaster is smaller <laughs> than a lot of current current books. Uh, but I think some of that was just efficiency of layout. It, it was much more technical manual back in the day. I'd I'd say uh, if there's anything that adds pages, it's art. Yeah, but art can help with finding things in a book, with, with navigating it. You know, you associate such and such a rule with such and such a picture. Mm -hmm. um, actually, come to think of it, it, just occurs to me that that is some of the problem with the current... Uh, current D and D books is the artwork is so kind of bland and beige and and anodyne that you just you don't create those kind of associations. It it doesn't have an impact on you. You know the old black and white amateur illustrations might not have been great, but they had character um, and would often help you reference the book because you'd remember flipping through. Ah, oh, that piece of art is close to close to the section I want. Yeah. Um, um yeah. I go through way too many books to ha to have that kind of specificity, but the if there's an issue that I've had with with art direction with the with with um with su with some games, it's re it's um it's having art represent a moment rather than represent what your table might see. Mm. If I realize that I realize that sounds a bit odd, and po and possibly nonsensical. But it's more. Uh, I I guess the be the the best way for me to put it is cons is consider consider a piece of art that w that might be in might might be in a, might be in a section depicting cl um classes. Mm -hmm. Like instead of de instead of depicting a let's use let's use the good old let's use the good old fighter as an as an instance, and yeah. in, in a lot instead instead of have instead of having a a um des a design that you, that is going to be significant that is going to be consistently easy to remember the artwork the artwork that you see of fighters is all over the place. Now, grant, granted, the con granted some of that is due to the fact that the concept of the fighter is going to be very broad, but most people are going to look at it as sword and board or, or great sword, not not some not somebody in not somebody in armor wielding a wielding a shield wielding a shield spear weapon that you'd see in Africa. Yeah, especially when that kind when that kind of weapon isn't supported in the. <laughs> In the equipment chapter, because th because they're still in the mindset of, oh, if you wanted to do that, just re just reflavor just reflavor a spear. Yeah. Oh, you want you want to do a kopesh? Just reflavor a longsword. Yeah. Well, you know that goes back to what we were saying about more crunchy granular systems. That you know, in those you could make it so that the spear is significantly mechanically different to to something else. Mm -hmm. Of course, the Zulu stabbing spear probably has more in common with a short sword than anything else. But oh, uh, it's it's one the the whole the whole just just reskin just reskin it is as one of my pet peeves um, for for a long time because at at times it can feel like it's being used as a get out of work free bandage. Yeah, well, I, yeah, home brewing has always been important part of the hobby but well, if you're gonna have something in the book you should also have it in the book th i think that i think a better way to put it is um homebrewing should be a spice not the main dish 
Hmm. I know I've I know I've, I know I've been picking on Palladium a lot, but that's because <laughs> it it formed the foundation of a lot of these issues because when I would run riffs, I ha I would have like a small book's worth of house rules, and I and that's too much. Yeah. I know some people say that you can that you can run it vanilla, but that's that's kind of like saying you only need a few dice. <laughs> I mean, some people think system doesn't matter, and to an extent, it's true that you can have fun or you can play any game using just about any system. But it's just so much easier when things work in synergy, and if you mm -hmm. have to modify them to do that, you know, it's more work, yeah. but it's better. Yeah, but now when it now when it comes to given the given the um ver given the variety of of undead that you ha that you have planned with um Whitechester, um I'm cu I'm curious if at if at any point you had considered some sort of some sort of mechanic regarding in, regarding endurance, i.e. i.e. being i.e. Um, reflecting how being in that being in that place for too long can wear, can wear on people. Yeah, uh, the um, the grim dark rules have this sort of concept of um, mental uh, hit points of a sort. So stress and uh, and lack of sleep and witnessing horrifying things can all wear on you um, and and break down your break down your mind. But I don't like the way in which a lot of games handle fear or madness where it's like purely random. So in the old days, you know, call of Cthulhu, you you know, you witness Azathoth and, and lose your mind, you roll on the insanity tables and you find out that you're a transvestite or something. I, I don't see what that has to do <laughs> with, with Azathoth necessarily. And it would take a great deal of rationalization and jumping through hoops to figure out how it did. So what I decided was I determine when you're afraid or when your psyche breaks as the, as the games master via the rules, mm -hmm. but you determine long ahead of time what happens when that happens. So you determine, you know, what happens to your character when they become terrified. Do they throw themselves mindlessly in a frenzy at the, at the source of their fear? Do they go catatonic? Do they run and hide? So you can't game the system because you've decided what happens ahead of time, and it might not be a useful or appropriate thing to happen when it does happen, but you've chosen what's the most appropriate fear reaction for your character. And mm. similarly, you know your character's personality if their mind breaks and and cracks, if you decide ahead of time, okay, this is the way in which they might go mad. They might shut down and become depressive, or mm -hmm. um, yeah, or take up drink even more than they already do, or, or whatever else. You know that again, you don't control when that's going to happen, but you know the way in which your character is, is is going to go mad. So I think that rebalances that that loss of control, which makes sense but isn't very fun for the player by providing them some control at least over over what happens, if not when it happens. Because um, mm -hmm. things like things like when your character gets hit with a fear effect and just has to run away from whatever did it, you know, that, that takes control out of the player's hands. They can't really play their character anymore. It's frustrating. It's annoying. It feels like it wastes time and so on. So giving the players back a bit of control in those situations seems like a good way to handle it for me. Mm -hmm. Now, with, the, with that in, with that in mind, what would, what would you say have been some of the take some of the um, learning experiences with, tr with trying to, Get with trying to fit, trying to finish and put and put out Whitechester. Uh, so um, mostly organizational, I guess. Um, so I had written a third of the book before I ever launched the the crowdfunding, and I'd taken into account my 
uh, pre-existing health issues around around depression and stuff, mm-hmm. oddly enough. And I thought it would easily be done within uh, a few more months, and it ended up taking almost almost the full year. So I guess even if you account for everything that you think can happen, things can still blindside you and uh, and screw that up. Um, because it, it was it was within a couple of weeks, I think, after I launched I launched it that I uh, ended up rushed into hospital and um, all sorts all sorts of problems. They just threw everything for a loop. Normally, on my books, I write almost everything myself, or I hire someone to do almost everything. Mm-hmm. Um. But this time I had to to get it done at all. I had to swallow my pride and get other people to work on it with me. Uh, otherwise, there's just no way it was going to get done in time or or possibly at all. Um, a lot of people were very very sweet, very nice, and worked either for free or cheaply to get to get it finished in a somewhat timely fashion. But giving up that that control. That was that was difficult <laughs> for me. I, I'm much more the auteur normally, um, but people really, really came through for me. So, yeah, something you haven't accounted for will always go wrong. Projects are always late. Um, communication is important as long as you let people know why it's late and you have a good reason. Um, I think you can you can get away with it. And you mm-hmm. know, nearly nearly dying is a pretty good excuse. <laughs> um as as those go i can't recommend it um yeah just uh and yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of goodwill out there so long as you communicate so long as you're open and honest about what's going on you keep people informed you know week by week day by day month by month um yeah um, that, that i i already knew that but that that's an important yeah. important lesson i think yeah i i may i may primarily j- just be just be a content creator when it comes when it comes to this sort of thing um even even if i'm one who keep who keeps dodging the idea of doing actual plays uh but i cannot understate the value of co- of communication just just from my own experiences alone yeah that that and make that and some and sometimes making clear what time zone I'm working with can work wonders for me. <laughs> yes, yes. And although my pet peeve is when is when people say that they're willing that they're willing to um, work late, and I'm like, how how late is late? Because if you're on the, if you're on the other side of the planet, that can complicate things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, I regularly stay up to five a.m. running tabletopless, so that, that's how late I'm willing to stay up. Yeah, but when somebody says they're willing to work late, it's like, okay, are we are we talking? You're put you're pushing midnight, or are you or are you willing to do the do the crack of dawn as if as if you're playing a four X game? <laughs> yeah. Ah, uh, but. With all th- with all that said, I do I do want to give my sincere thanks for for ta- for you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way up to my, to my temple and indulge in the in the particular bit of madness that happens around here. <laughs> well, I needed the steps. So. Mm-hmm. And anytime <laughs> you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here. Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody!